Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis by sending a donation with the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month by going to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Dangerous Assignment. The original air date is February 18th, 1953, and the title is Dr. Mitsuko Kidnapping. Dangerous Assignment, transcribed starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to prove that sometimes the best way to win a fight is to get knocked flat on your back. Morning, Commissioner. You sent for me? Steve, a serious charge was filed against us yesterday in Tokyo. A charge that's caused quite a stir among the Japanese people. What's the trouble? A doctor named Mitsuko was kidnapped, beaten, held captive by some agency of our government operating in Japan. What exactly? What agency, Commissioner? We don't know. Dr. Mitsuko is unable to identify the office allegedly involved. This case is serious, Steve. It could damage Japanese-American relations. Yeah, certain interests could use the incident to whip up anti-American sentiment. It's already being used for just that purpose. Get over there, Steve. Find out who's behind all this. Set this thing straight and do it fast. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sunday evenings on most NBC stations, you can hear the best in entertaining radio programming. Yes, for comedy, there's the Phil Harris, Alice Faye show, starring Phil, Alice, Frankie Remley, Julius Abruzio, Brother William, and young Alice and Phyllis. You'll enjoy the mirth and music provided by this delightful group of stellar comedians. So be sure to tune in Sunday. Theater Guild on the Air stars Hollywood and Broadway actors and actresses in the best in available novels and plays. And their dramatizations make great radio listening each Sunday. For mystery adventure, be sure to hear Dragnet, the true stories of your police force in action. It's a trio of the top radio shows for your listening pleasure. Hear them all Sunday on most NBC stations. Sure, I've got my assignment. Get over to Japan and find out if a U.S. government agency was actually involved in the kidnapping of a certain Dr. Mitsuko. If not, find out who rigged it. The incident contains enough potential dynamite to damage seriously the relations between the two governments, and it's got to be cleared up, but fast. It's early Friday evening when my plane lands in Tokyo. I check first with Major Conlon of U.S. Intelligence, and a half hour later, I arrive at Dr. Mitsuko's house in the suburbs. I follow a servant into the study and find the doctor isn't alone. Sitting close and balancing a large camera on his knee is a member of the local press. Come in, Mr. Mitchell. Come in. Good evening, doctor. Permit me to introduce Mr. Tanaji. Hiya, Mitch. I'm with the Yokohama Press. Got a good side? Oh, uh, what? 
Your face, man, right side or left side. I want to snap a photo. Oh, well, I've been told the back of my head is my best side. Oh, man, you're kidding. How about from this angle, huh? Look, Mr. Tanaji. Uh, call me Jackie. Okay, Jackie, let's skip the picture, huh? Skip it, he says. Man, I've got to get your fizz or my chief will blow his rocker. He'll flip his dolly. He'll be... Down, really... boy, down. Dr. Mitsuko, I have some important business to discuss. Oh, uh, feel free. I already know the whole story. Yeah, so does everybody else in Tokyo, it seems. Uh, please, do be seated, Mr. Mitchell. Thanks, Doctor. I'll start the ball rolling. It's Wednesday evening. Tokyo has settled down for the night. A car slides up to the curb and two sinister figures I get out. I said down, Jackie, down. Oh, sorry, just filling in the color. Dr. Mitsuko. As Mr. Tanachi has said, it was last Wednesday evening. I was working late in my study here when the doorbell rang. I answer it. There were two men. Both American? One was American. He was dressed in uniform of your military. And the other man? Japanese. He was introduced to me as interpreter. They said they wished to ask me some questions, so I invited them in. What sort of questions did they ask you, Doctor? About my past, my family, political beliefs. Uh, then the American said I was to accompany them to headquarters. But he didn't mention whose headquarters? No. As I had nothing to fear, nothing to hide, I was quite willing to go with them. There was a car waiting outside. An official car of your government, Mr. Mitchell. As I was about to step inside, I was struck on the head. When I regained consciousness, I was being carried into a house. How long were you unconscious? Uh, ten minutes, approximately. Go on, Doctor. I was led to a room in the cellar of the house and again questioned. They demand I tell them what I knew of the Blue Cord. The Blue Cord? Yes, yeah, secret society, Mitch. Political club, not so nice. I had never heard of this Blue Cord. I told them that, but they would not believe me. They beat me. I see. How long did they keep you there? Three days. I was released after money was paid. Money? Gets real interesting, doesn't it, Mitch? On the second day, the American told me he could arrange for my release, but a sum of money would have to be paid, $5,000. How was this money paid out? Uh, a note was sent to my family. The money was left in the package under the Sujito Bridge. About this house where you were kept prisoner, would you recognize it? Only what I saw within the house. A long, narrow corridor, a flight of stairs, and the cellar, yes. Mm, anything else? Like a particular sound of some kind? Heavy traffic noise from outside or a train whistle, anything like that? No. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Mitchell. Yes? Mr. Mitchell, please. This is Major Connell. Oh, yes. One moment, please. For you, Mr. Mitchell. A Major Conlon. Oh, Major Conlon. Army intelligence. Keen, sharp fellow. Thanks, Doctor. Yeah, Major? Brace yourself, Steve. Looks like Mitsuko wasn't the only one to get taken for a ride. What? Ito Sakatura, university professor. He was kidnapped, beaten, and held captive by two men posing as representatives of the U.S. government, released a couple of hours ago. Oh, great. He's sitting in my office now with a couple of Japanese government mm. officials. You better come on down. They all look very unhappy. Ito Sakatura's story is pretty much the same as Dr. Mitsuko's. Kidnapped victim number two was picked up by the same two gents, taken away blindfolded in the same car to the same house and asked the same questions. Sakatura, however, was not held captive in the cellar, but in an attic room, and that, as it turns out, makes a big difference. You're certain of the sound you heard, Mr. Sakatura? That they didn't come from within the house? Yes, Major Conlon, I am certain. A pounding noise like someone striking metal with a hammer, huh? That is correct. And then there was the odor of paint. Unmistakable, Mr. Mitchell. That too seemed to come from outside the house. Hammering on metal, odor of paint. What does that mean to you, Major? Offhand, I'd say paint shop. The automotive kind, maybe. Yeah, Mr. Sakatura. Yes? How long a ride was it from the time you were picked up till you reached the house? Fifteen minutes, I would say. Let's look at the map, Major. Now, let's see. Where does Mr. Sakatura live here? Right here, Steve. Fifteen-minute ride from this point would be within the radius of this circle. Now, how about Dr. Mitsuko? He lives... Uh... Here. So if he was taken for a ten-minute ride, it'd have to be within this circle... Yeah. And you notice the two circles overlap right here. The house we're looking for could be in this area. Uh, awful lot of ground to cover there, Steve. Well, let's make a stab at it. A 
quarter of an hour later, the Major and I arrive at the center of the area, marked off on our map. We cruise around block after block, working toward the outer rim of the area, and the only thing that comes anywhere near what we're looking for is a garage on a quiet side street. Next to the garage is a large two-story house. I go up and ring the bell. Things seem to start adding up fast when a tall, slender gent dressed in the uniform of an American officer opens the door. Yes, what is it? Hello, Lieutenant. Mind if I come in? Maybe I do mind. What do you want? Who are you? My credentials. Oh, United States agent, huh? Right. I'd like to have a little talk with you. Okay. In here. I'd like to look at your ID card. Oh, sure. I, um... Uh... I don't seem to have my wallet with me. It's probably in there. My name's Gorman, Johnny Gorman, San Francisco. What district? Richmond. That's what they call south of the slot, huh? You don't know San Francisco, pal. Richmond's out in the avenues. Uh, here's my card on the chair. Wallet's probably I'll in get the it. Inside. Okay. Yeah, here's your wallet. Uh-huh. Card seems to be okay. Look, what's this all about? I am investigating the Misuko case. I guess you've heard about it. Who hasn't heard about it? And you know that one of the men who picked up Mitsuko is dressed in the uniform of an American officer? So? So, don't get sore if I ask you a few questions. You live here alone? Yeah, sure. Pretty big house for just one guy, isn't it? I suppose. I just didn't bother to move after the family left. Family? Wife and kids, they went back to the States a month ago. I'm due to go back myself in a couple of weeks. You got a picture of them handy? Yeah. In the wallet there. Help yourself. Hey. Okay, wise guy, on your feet. Uh, looks like I sort of let myself wide open for that one, huh, Lieutenant? Yeah, you sure did. And you're wide open for a couple of slugs from this gun if you try anything smart. Now, just stand where you are. I've got a little phone call to make. Steve Mitchell will continue his dangerous assignment in just a moment. When the recent floods brought tragedy and disaster to England, Belgium, and Holland, Holland was the country hardest hit. And right now, following this loss of millions of dollars worth of homes, land, crops, and livestock, the people of Holland need help desperately. And most of us are eager to do what we can to relieve their misery. Well, the best way for you to help is to make a contribution to CARE, C-A-R-E. CARE is an international nonprofit organization with a background of experience in relief. CARE already has completed all arrangements necessary to distribute whatever help is most needed by the flood victims of the Netherlands. Now, to help in the best way, send your check or money order to CARE. CARE, New York City. That address again, CARE, New York City. Your contribution by check or money order to CARE is the best way you can help in this century's most tragic disaster. Now back to Dangerous Assignment and Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Hey, look, Gorman. Just stand real still while I'm making this call. So, you're my boy, Lieutenant, huh? Right now, I'd say you were mine. Hello, let me speak to Major Conlon. Conlon, wait a minute. Shut up. What's that? Oh, he's not in. Uh, look, I've got a guy here who might tie into this kidnapping deal. Oh, fine. Uh, name's Mitchell, posing as a government agent. He said... What? Are you sure? Well, describe him. Yeah, it checks. Sorry. Well, looks like I owe you an apology, Mitchell. They tell me at headquarters you're legit. I guess this Mitsuko incident has made us all jumpy. He was grabbed by a guy posing as one of your representatives, and when you showed up, I... Well, I I guess I figured... (laughs) Sure, no harm done, Lieutenant. But if you want to talk to Major Conlon, why don't you just turn around? Hmm? Hey. Hello, Gorman. Major Conlon. Yeah, we came together. He's been standing in the hallway for the last five minutes. (laughs) 
So that's why you left yourself open for a poke in the jaw. Yeah, sort of the hard way of finding out if you'd make a break. Well, Steve, looks like this is a blind alley. Any more ideas? I'm fresh out, Conlon. Let's go see Dr. Mitsuko again. Go back over the whole story and see if we've overlooked any leads. Yes? We'd like to see Dr. Mitsuko again. Well, Dr. Mitsuko not in. Oh? Was called away to headquarters again. Headquarters? Hey, wait a minute. Who sent for him? It was at request of a Mr. Steve Mitchell. What? Steve. Oh, great. The kidnappers have him again. Come on, we'd better get to that second victim, Sakatura's house, before they grab him. Here's his house. Lights on? Yeah. Maybe everything's okay. It better be. Huh. Mr. Sakatura. Mr. Sakatura. I don't like it, Steve. Come on. Let's go around the side. It should be a window. Yeah, right here. Maybe. Yeah, let's see. Hey, Steve. There he is inside. Sitting in a chair with his head on his chest. Sakatura! Get back, Conan. Right. Okay, come on. Watch the broken glass. He is done for, Steve. Didn't even move when he broke the window. Yeah, I know. There's no mark on him, though. I'll raise up his head, maybe. Oh. Hey, okay. he's alive. Uh, uh, one moment, please. Uh, turn the volume up on my hearing aid. Hearing it? Oh, fine. No wonder he didn't hear us. Well, that's a relief. I uh, was having a slight nap, and uh, the window is all broken. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, come on, Mr. Sakatura. We want to put you in a safe place for the time being. <laughs> And you're sure you haven't overlooked telling us anything that might give us a lead on the location of that house, Mr. Sakatura? I've told you everything, Mr. Mitchell. Now, suppose you tell me something, please. What's that? Who is to pay for my broken window? Hey, don't worry about that, Mr. Sakatura. New window will stop Sakatura's worries fast. Oh, we'll take care of it. Steve, the only thing we've got to go on is that hammering noise and the smell of paint. But so far, that's given us nothing. Yeah, we must be wrong about it being an auto paint shop. Yeah, but the hammering on metal, the smell, the sound of cars. I know, but I figure the guys running this deal would be too smart to set up a shop near a place that could be traced that easily. So? So, maybe the noise and the smell of paint were only a temporary thing, something that started after the kidnappers picked their headquarters. Some kind of construction job, maybe? Yeah, either that or a remodeling job. Look, suppose you let me out here. Where are you going? I'll grab a cab and get over to the area, start combing it again. After you drop Mr. Sakatura at headquarters, you can join me. Right. I've got to work fast. If they've got Dr. Mitsuko again, it'll be a race to get to him alive. And that's one race I don't want to see end in a dead heat. I grab a cab and head for the area we'd marked out on the map. I cruise up one street and down the other. Time is slipping away. I'm getting nowhere. Then I spot something. A remodeled warehouse with a tin roof that would account for the sound of hammering on metal in the warehouse is sporting a fresh paint job. Looks like I'm getting warm. I pay off the cab and start working the area over on foot. Yeah, there's a broken down old house just on the other side of the warehouse. I ease around to the back. There's a shack. I go inside. There's a car hidden there. And it's got a U.S. government seal painted on the door. I hear somebody coming. I crouch back in the shadows. A big guy looms up, an American. I step out in front of him. Uh, yo, what are you, sweetheart? Oh, oh. He crumples up fast. Somebody else scurries up. I dive at him and make a grab. I, I eat Mitchell. Well, well. Tanaji, the boy reporter. Let go, let go. Oh, no, we're going to have a little talk. No, no. Okay, suppose we bounce you off the car a couple of times. One, we 
Would you like to try for two? No, no, no. No, I'll talk. You and this American stooge of yours were working the kidnap racket, huh? Yes. What was your pitch? Trying to create an incident and damage relations between our two governments? Oh, no, no. We were just doing it for the money. Well, then why the phony government car and your stooge in an American uniform? Well, that way we thought the victims would keep quiet. They'd be afraid to tell about the shakedown. I see. One thing I don't get, Tanaji. When I questioned your first victim, Dr. Mitsuko, you were there making with the phony reporter pitch. How come he didn't give you away? Oh, my camera. There was a gun in it, pointed at him. I came to warn him to keep quiet, and that's when you walked in. I see. That's why you grabbed Mitsuko the second time, huh? To shut him up. What are you talking about? We didn't grab him again. Don't give me that. His servant told us he'd gotten a phony call to headquarters again. I, I tell you, I don't know anything about it. And where is he? Right here, Mr. Mitsuko. Huh? Dr. Mitsuko. Yes. Why the gun? For obvious purpose, Mr. Mitchell. Wait a minute. You and Tanaji rigged this whole deal together? No, no. I have been following you, Mr. Mitchell, hoping you would lead me to kidnap us. Thank you very much for being so obliging. I don't get it. It's really quite simple. Tanaji and his American friend kidnapped me, and as he would put it, shook me down. I realized at once it was simple and rather amateurish extortion plot. But I also realized that here was my golden opportunity. Opportunity? Yes. To do something that I and a few friends of mine have been longing to do for some time. Drive a wedge between my government and yours. I see. So you put up a big squawk about the kidnapping. Exactly. And when the next victim, Sakatura, heard of my great courage, he did same. And thus, very innocently... Help me put fuel on the flames. Bully for you. And thanks to you, fortunately, I can bring my plans to perfect conclusion. What do you mean? My story will be that I was kidnapped again and brought here. I heard two of you quarreling over money. You fought and killed each other. Your dead bodies found together will give conclusive proof that a United States agent was in charge of the plot. No, wait. Wait, Dr. Mitsuko. Stand Maybe back, Tanaji. I say stand no. back. No, no, no. The slug catches Tanaji in the shoulder. He staggers back into me. We both go down. On the way, I grab the electric wire and jerk the overhead bulb loose. I hit the floor and so does the little light bulb. The shack's in darkness. Mitsuko is shooting blind. I roll quietly under the car. I can hear him stalking me. I hug the floor. Then I spot the shadow of his legs as he works his way along the side of the car. I reach out under the running board, grab his ankles, and jerk hard. Ah! He hits the ground like a tree before he can recover. I've got his gun. Just relax, partner, while I take care of Tanaji. He's a lot more valuable to me right now because his confession gets my government off the hook. My head. Well, after all, you were sure trying to bring a lot of trouble to a head, Mitsuko. I just thought I'd let you find out how it feels. star, Brian Donlevy, will return in just a moment. Thursday evenings filled with top radio shows on the NBC radio network. Over most NBC stations, you can hear such stellar programs as The Roy Rogers Show, Father Knows Best, Truth or Consequences, The Judy Canova Show, and Eddie Cantor's Show Business Show. From the Double R Bar Ranch in Paradise Valley, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans bring you the best in Western music and adventure. Then it's time for Robert Young to star in Father Knows Best, The Amusing Lives of the Anderson Family. Truth or Consequences, America's favorite party game, is presided over by Ralph Aren't We Devils Edwards. His zany stunts and hilarious consequences are certain to keep you amused each Thursday evening. The Judy Canova Show stars the population of Cactus Junction in the Thursday evening program filled with laugh-packed enjoyment. And then Eddie Cantor's show business show recalls the world of show business with which Eddie is so familiar. Every Thursday evening over most NBC stations, you can hear all these wonderful programs, so be sure to listen. Next week, the Riviera. I make like a jewel thief. And that will be Steve Mitchell's dangerous assignment next week. Included in tonight's cast were Paul Duboff, Sidney Miller, Rye Billsbury, Paul Fries, and Peter Leeds. This is John Storm speaking.
Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian John Doe, and is directed by Bill Karn. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another transcribed Dangerous Assignment. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Welcome back. A great little twist of a victim using a normal kidnapping to his own ends to make it a political action. Although the idea of framing someone who wasn't in the country at the time of the kidnapping as the mastermind seems a little poorly thought out. However, I suspect that those who would be most susceptible to that sort of lie might not be logic out of it or might ignore key facts that don't confirm their prior biases. It was interesting to hear Steve get himself into trouble by trying to be clever uh, with the lieutenant by hoping the lieutenant would accept false information on San Francisco and show that he hadn't lived there. Instead, he made the lieutenant suspicious that Steve was pretending to know San Francisco but didn't. The PSA for flood relief was tied to the North Sea Flood, which killed 2,551 people from January 31st and February 1st, 1953 in Holland, Belgium, Scotland, and England. While Holland was the focus of the PSA and the relief effort, This was actually the worst flood to hit England and Scotland in the 20th century. It's amazing sometimes to hear these events, which were so big, but are essentially forgotten to modern history books here in the States. Although it should be said that February 1st is still commemorated in Holland to this day. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we have some comments on YouTube regarding our 4,300th episode special, Suspense, The Man Who Murders People, Ronser writes, great show, congrats on 4,300 episodes, Harry says, well, I did not expect that, it was very enjoyable, thank you very much, and then Carissa writes, ha, huh, I guessed right. Well, as a guy who didn't guess till the last few minutes, I have to tip my hat to you. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Sean. Sean has been one of our Patreon supporters since June of 2021, currently supporting the podcast at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Sean, and that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. If you're listening to the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All those great things that help YouTube channels to grow. We will be back next Wednesday with another dangerous assignment, but join us back here tomorrow for Mr. Chameleon, where... Why don't you bury him? Bury him and forget about him like all the rest. Because he was murdered, and I am going to find the murderer. He was shot not a hundred feet away from this place. Well, don't look at me. I never leave this place. I've been away from my job in three years. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Rose. Let me get this straight. You haven't been out of this house in three years. You heard me. Anyone will tell you. I ain't well. Besides, I like to keep an eye on these guys. I'm like a mother to them. You're a liar, Rose. You're a dirty liar. Well, one of your paying guests seems to disagree. Why is she a liar? Because she is. I had to wait ten minutes the other night to get a cop. I was in my room, wasn't I? No one ever seen me leave this place. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.